Praise the Lord. Welcome to the house of the Lord tonight. Good to be in the presence of the Lord. Looking forward to what God's going to do in our hearts and our lives. Stand with me tonight. Let's sing this chorus. You know it well. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter. with thanksgiving into his courts with praise oh this is the day that the Lord hath made and because he made it I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it because God's been good to me turn tell somebody God's been good to me God's been good to me shake somebody's hand greet somebody as we get ready to enter into worship tonight sister Amy's coming to lead us greet somebody tonight
come glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air coming after you and me joy is ours to share oh what rejoicing there will be when the saints shall rise headed for that jubilee yonder in the sky oh what singing what a day of shouting on that happy morning we all shall rise oh what glory hallelujah when we meet our blessed savior in the sky well seems that now i almost see all the same death rising for that jubilee that is just ahead oh in the twinkling of an eye
for the hope that we have. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise is to of all glory, of all adoration. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, what you've done, and what you're doing, what you're yet to do. God, we love you. We worship you. We praise your name. We bless you. In the name of Jesus, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you for worshiping tonight. Amen. We're glad that you're here. Turn and tell somebody, I'm glad you're here. And uh, we're glad to have Sister Jessica home. Glad she's back. Yeah. Anybody travel farther than Bangladesh to get here tonight? Anybody? No, she flew in this afternoon and uh, is here in church tonight. And so uh, you may be tired, but you're not more tired than her, I promise. And so I appreciate i uh, glad she's back safely and uh, looking forward to hearing all about what God did and uh, thankful for the goodness of the Lord. The choir is getting ready to uh, minister. Just let the Lord minister to you tonight.
that there's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm thankful that we can call upon a God that's able to do something about the situations that we're in. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Uh, We want to remember the Isaiah Hill family. Uh, That visitation will be here tomorrow night uh, and the funeral on Tuesday at 10 a.m. And uh, so if you're able to be here, I know that that would be greatly appreciated. But let's be in prayer for them either way. Uh, Let's remember Brother Bob Walker, um, just that God would touch him. Uh, Brother Bowen, that God would be in touch with him. Uh, Let's remember the election, amen, Tuesday coming up, that God would work. Amen. He's in control of all things. And uh, let's just believe him. Let's remember Joshua as well. Uh, Joshua Lacey, that God would continue that which he started. Man, I think it'd be good, too. There's a storm up there a couple days ago, uh, a little bit farther north of us. But I've got a, I've got a cousin that, pa- or that pastors there in Powderly area, and several of the homes were just completely destroyed in that area. So let's, let's continue to remember them as well. But somebody on my right-hand side, you got a request tonight you want to make known. Man, yes, Sister Sprayberry. Unspoken. I mean, anybody else got an unspoken? Man, God sees and he knows tonight. Amen. Anybody else here on my right? Brother Brown. Lost loved ones. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody else got lost loved ones? Man, the Lord's coming back. Man, they got to be ready. Let's pray that God would bring them in by whatever means necessary. Amen. Anybody else here tonight? Yes, brother. Sister Ruth. Yes, let's continue to remember Sister Ruth Flores. Amen. Praise the Lord. I mean, anybody here on my left tonight, you got a prayer request? Yes, Sister Donna. All right, brother and sister Wilson, that God would touch them. Amen. Yes, sister. All right, let's remember Sister Charlene. Amen. Yes, brother. Man, continue to remember Sister Becky tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Man, anybody else here on my left-hand side? Man, if we can stand tonight as we take these needs to the Lord in prayer. I don't think I'll ever forget. I remember uh, Sister Snow was talking to somebody one time, and I was happened to be standing there. And they said, you know, the least we can do is pray. And she looked at them, and she said, no, that's the best thing that we can do. Man, the best thing that we can do is take the needs that are too big for us to a God that's bigger than it all. Man, so let's lift our hands and do that tonight and let's believe in faith that He's able. God, we thank You, Lord, that You're in control of all things. You saw every need and situation before it ever came on our radar. Lord, and You're still in control tonight. I pray, God, that You would work and move and minister. I pray, God, that You would speak like You and You alone are able to. I ask that you would come by and begin to work in these situations in such a way that testimonies would begin to arise. 
that you draw the lost to salvation, that even now in this moment, that the convicting power of the Holy Ghost would grip their hearts, Lord, and lead them to a place of recognition of their need for you. I pray that in these elections coming up, that you would work and you'd bring about, God, that you'd send revival to this nation. We're in a desperate need of it, and we know that you're the only one that can bring it about. God, I pray for those that are sick in body tonight. The stripes that you took on your back are still enough. They're still able to bring healing, and we believe you, God, to work in a miraculous way. Speak in this service, in every need, in every situation, in every circumstance, God. Show yourself faithful and true. We believe you, and we thank you tonight. Lord, that you're close and you're near. God, that you're able to move in the situations of our life and that you desire to bring about the answer to the request that we bring to you. Yes. Go ahead. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Resist the devil and he'll flee. Amen. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Praise the 
Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Ushers come. <laughs> I appreciate somebody's got a testimony. Hallelujah. God is good. Praise the Lord. He is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. You know, I was uh, thinking we're going to receive the offering tonight, and uh, uh, there's a verse, uh, it's a familiar verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, Paul is writing, he said, he that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, he that sows bountifully shall reap bountifully. And then he says, every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. According as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. He said, not grudgingly, not out of necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. You know, one of the things we realize is how much God, how good God is, and how much God takes care of us, and we have that relationship with him, and our heart is in tune with him, and what he has given to us, we want to be obedient. We want to submit ourselves unto his word and give back unto him. Because it's a matter of the heart. Giving is a matter of the heart. Praise the Lord. The next verse says, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always having all sufficiency in all things. All, that's a big word, sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. You know, we, we live in a society today that tells you, you give $10, God will give you 100 And it's kind of like a slot machine, and it's kind of like, you know, uh, uh, buying a CD or something. Well, God, as we submit to him is able to make all grace abound unto us, that we can have sufficiency in everything for every good work. Praise the Lord. God wants to pour out his blessings upon us as we submit to him, and one of the areas we submit is giving. Glory to God. Now, today's Building Fund Sunday. Uh, today's the day we we stress giving toward the Building Fund. We've... Uh, we got a great building God has provided for us. You say, well, the building's already paid for. Well, it costs money to keep the doors open, keep the air conditioner and the heat running. Uh, it costs money to keep up, praise the Lord. And we're wanting someday to build another building. Glory to God. You give tonight is unto the Lord. I know that God will minister to you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have to give. And God, we pray that you would just minister in this offering tonight. I pray that you would touch the hearts of your people. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to give. Bless the gift and giver, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. Amen. Today is uh, Daylight Savings time Day, and uh, y'all enjoy your extra hour of sleep this morning, uh, hours back. That's really nice, but uh, one of the other negative aspects of it is it gets dark so early. And I was thinking about that today. Uh, I was driving out to the Williams uh, for their... Uh, um, their uh, baby shower, thank you, uh, baby shower, and I was driving out that way, and I was thinking, oh my, it's going to get dark early tonight, and I was thinking, you know, of course, you walked in here in the light, you leave tonight, it's going to be dark out there, and I was thinking of how the uh, increase of darkness in this season is uh, somewhat of a symbol of the increased darkness of the day and hour that we're living in. We're living in uh, dark times spiritually uh, in, in, in the world around us. We're living in, uh, Paul told Timothy, he described it as perilous, dangerous times and uh, where darkness is increased and uh, we're, we're living in those, those days where it seems like the, the darkness is coming faster. It's coming at us faster and faster and faster. And uh, in some regards, uh, we could uh, have a perspective of saying, uh, you know, of, uh, you know of, of fear and of uncertainty. We could have that approach, that a mindset of despair um, but, but we shouldn't have that perspective at all. In fact, Jesus said, when you see these things come to pass, lift up your head, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. And in the midst of the darkness that's around us, in the midst of these uh, dark days that we are uh, a part of or in, in involved in in this day and hour that we're living in, let's keep our head up. Let's keep our focus up on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It's not a time to, to get discouraged or get, uh, get in despair. We're on the winning side. Turn and tell somebody, I'm on the winning side. And the darkness may be coming in and it may be getting worse and worse, but Jesus still has a church and we're still going with him when he returns. We don't have to fear or be in despair. And I'm thankful that we are on the winning side. And that light always wins. Light always wins. And Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. Well, I appreciate uh, the fact that we uh, have several in our church that are uh, wonderful preachers. We're, uh, I really, honestly, I don't know that you guys really understand how spoiled you are. Um, I don't know that you do. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, and you, you say you might, but, but I don't know that you really do if you've been at Faith Tabernacle for any length of time. Uh, we are blessed at Faith Tabernacle with many, many people that uh, are wonderful uh, preachers of the Word of God. And uh, one of those tonight uh, we're going to hear from, uh, we're, we're excited to hear, uh, come ahead, Brother Justin Smith is going to be preaching for us tonight. And I just appreciate his spirit and his heart and his desire to be used of the Lord. He was, you got, a, oh, you got an ovation before you even preached, man, that's awesome. Uh, but I appreciate his heart to, to, to minister and to serve uh, the Lord, and I'm thankful for him. Uh, Pastor Snow will be back Wednesday. He'll be traveling back, and so we're thankful for him. Pray for him. We just appreciate uh, the Smith family and appreciate Brother Justin. I don't know if your wife's going to sing, whatever, uh, but just uh, take your liberty. And as he brings us to an altar, let's come receive from the Lord tonight. God's good, isn't he? And I'll tell you, um, if you were, if you're not familiar uh, with our circumstance, I'll shed a little bit of light tonight. I was a little bit timid uh, to respond to Brother Snow when he asked me if I could preach tonight just because we haven't made many uh, Sunday night services lately. And uh, the reason for that is just since the wreck, uh, the only time that I'm not in pain is when I'm laying down in a bed, uh, which isn't often. So I try to get there when I can. And I just want you to continue to pray for us. The Lord's been turning things around in that situation. Um, we don't share a whole lot. I don't, I don't go into a lot of belly aching, but it's been an uphill battle. And uh, Sister Stamp sent us a card about a month ago 
And uh, me and my wife, we read that thing every morning for two weeks before we started our work day. And uh, the prayer that she prayed over us and that card we were holding on to, and just like she prayed, we watched it come to pass. And, um, and we're just trusting the Lord to continue to help us, and we desire your prayers. Amen. But right here tonight, our, our number one uh, desire is that the Lord would come down and meet with us right here. Um, it's been a strange, uh, a strange time in, in our life, and if, if you're a preacher, you'll understand this, but um, as a preacher, your, your main desire and, and passion and purpose in life is to preach the gospel. And, um, and you, you have to do other things and take care of other things. And, um, and just with some of the way that the wreck happened and the parts of my body that were affected, it just, you know, I don't feel like preaching as much as I used to sometimes. I don't feel a lot of the way that I used to sometimes. And uh, about a week ago, I was praying, and I don't know where the Lord dropped a message on my heart. And, uh, and I just, you know... I started meditating on it and just trying to figure out, you know, when, when we're going to preach it because I'm just, I'm just, can I be honest with you here for a few minutes? Is that all right? I just hadn't felt uh, a whole lot of get up and go with me. It's been difficult, you know, and there's been uh, mornings you can ask my wife. I've had to argue with myself for a half an hour to make myself go to work uh, just because mentally I didn't feel like I could handle the day. And so, um, uh, I do a lot of focus on getting me and my family through the day. There isn't a whole lot of times that my focus gets out here lately. And uh, as the Lord began to work these things over in my heart and I began to pray about them, it was, I'm just telling you, it was an emotional experience because it was somewhat unexpected. And then the invitation came from Brother Snow, and I told him, I said, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit reserved, but I have a message on my heart. And so I'm going to do my best to preach to you tonight um, out of the book of Hebrews, Chapter number 12, and uh, we'll read here the first three verses, and we're just going to trust the Lord to help us. I appreciate the sweet spirit that's always here at Faith Tabernacle, Um, and if this is all that you're used to, like Brother Tim said, you you really don't know how blessed you are, but uh, if you ever went on vacation and went somewhere else, you might have figured it out, amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, let's read these first three verses together. Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Amen. I want to preach just a simple thought tonight on running when it hurts. Amen. Running when it hurts. Thank you for standing for the reading of the word of God. Amen. Life is a beautiful thing, isn't it? I mean, we celebrate, we celebrate annually the lives of those that we love. We call them birthdays, amen. We get pretty excited about birthdays. I hadn't been excited about a birthday since I probably turned 18, I would say. Uh, if I got excited about that one, you know, there was, my dad was very clear to me that 18 came with a lot of responsibility. And, uh, you know, I don't know that I've been too excited about one, but this year, uh, Henry is figuring out that his birthday was in order after everybody else's. And so every day in the month of August, uh, after we got past uh, Tynes' birthday, he was telling me, you know, just a few more days until your birthday, and he would sing me happy birthday. And so from August 6th to August 26th, my little buddy, he sang me happy birthday every morning, and uh, he actually got me excited about a birthday this year. And... uh, You know, we celebrate the lives of people that we love. Many of us went out this afternoon and gave gifts and we're excited for Brother Caleb and Sister Lindsay, ain't we? Amen. We're excited to celebrate life. Amen. We celebrate our anniversaries of our marriages. We celebrate the arrival of joy with a newborn. We celebrate any time a spiritually dead man leaves behind the wages of sin and becomes a brand new man in Christ Jesus. We are keen to celebrate life. 
because life is beautiful. Yet life is also very complex. Along with the joy and smiles and laughter, it brings us moments of weeping and pain and questions and sorrows. And you can rest assured that you will encounter all of these emotions in your life. Amen. Whether you're saved or not, whether you're serving God or not, whether you're whether you're doing right or you're doing wrong, you're going to have highs and you're going to have lows. You're going to have seasons of joy. You're going to have seasons of sorrow. Amen. It's necessary in this life. That's what life is. It's a mixture of all of these things. And if you're looking for a reason to get out, you're going to find a reason. If you're looking for a reason to be offended, you're going to find one. If you're looking for a fault in this church, you're going to find one. If you're looking for a reason to do anything other than press on, you're going to find that reason. Amen. I want you to know it doesn't matter how long you serve God. If it's in your heart to find a way out, rest assured you will find a way out. Amen. And if, if, if the way that this life is going dictates how you will serve your God, your relationship with God will always be up and down. Amen. But there comes a time in your life when you must learn to stand as Job did and not charge God foolishly. Amen. There are, there are going to be times in your life if there have not been, and I believe the elders of the church can say amen to this tonight. But there will come times in your life that your faith will be tested. Your faith will be shaken. Everything that you say that you, be, that you stand on will be questioned and we will find out what you really believe. Amen. Rest assured, it'll happen. And so the question tonight is not, is life going to get hard or are there going to be circumstances that are overwhelming, that are too complex for my human emotions to process, so it's going to put me in a place of despair and tears? The answer is yes, that time in my life is going to happen. But the difference between my life and the life of the unbeliever is that when I find myself in the seasons of my lows, I find myself open to the healing of God rather than closed off to his presence. Amen. I want to preach to you tonight if the Lord will help me on running when it hurts. Amen. Is there water hiding in this thing? Look at this. If you drank it this morning, oh, it cracked. It's good. It's fresh. It was getting put in use either way. I mean, in August of 1932, a hymn writer named Thomas Dorsey had been asked to go and play the song services at a revival in St. Louis. He was a very well-known pianist and hymn writer. So he goes to head off to the service in St. Louis from Chicago and gets to the outskirts of the city, and he realizes that he's left his sheet music there at his house. It's not going to do very much good at him in the apartment in Chicago when he's supposed to be in St. Louis. So he turns around, heads home, and when he's there, he said that he got a very easy unfeeling about leaving his wife alone there. He said that uh, he decided that he would stay and not go to the revival. His wife, Nettie, was in her ninth month of pregnancy, and she, rest, she assured him that he could rest easy and that he could uh, go to this revival and that everything would be fine. She felt like he needed to go. And so he went. And, uh, and he said of himself, his own accord, the service was absolutely tremendous. People were singing and praying and worshiping God until the late hours while he played. He said he absolutely played himself to the point of exhaustion. And as he walked off the platform that night, a young man ran up to him with a little telegram from Western Union. And on that note, all it said is, your wife just died. Now, here sits this man who 24 hours before was standing in the living room, and his wife said, I think that you need to go to this revival. And he's saying, I feel like I should stay home. And this is the note that's met with him when he comes off the platform. Mr. Dorsey went home, and he found out not only had his wife passed, but the baby boy that his wife had given birth to passed during the night as well. Understandably, Mr. Dorsey fell into a deep place of despair. He went into solitude locked himself in his room and wouldn't come out, wouldn't speak to people. Sometime later, he said that he was sitting at his piano, still in solitude. The evening sun was creeping through the windows, and he'd been asking God to help him. He said, and suddenly there was a peace like I've never known come over my soul. He said, my fingers began to play a melody that I'd never heard before, and I poured my heart out to God. And these are the words that he said. 
Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. I am tired. I am weak. And I am worn. You ever been there in life? You ever said that to God? God, I just don't know if I can take any more. I'm tired. I'm wore out, God. I don't know if I can endure anymore. I just need help, God. Anybody ever been there? Through the storm and through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. He penned those words that have been a comfort to our heart, and he said this as he told the story. He said, it is without a doubt that the Lord gave me those words and melody but he also healed my spirit. I learned that when we are in our deepest grief, when we feel the furthest from God, this is when he is closest, and we are the most open to his restoring power. And so I go on living for God willingly and joyfully until that blessed day when he will take me and lead me home. And that sounds like a man that learned how to overcome the circumstances of life. I don't, I don't stand here and say and tell that story to make light of any of your circumstances. I'm telling you that that man, and let me, let me tell you what I forgot to tell you about Mr. Dorsey. Mr. Dorsey was a very accomplished jazz musician. He already had an up and coming, uh, a, a very unfamiliar path for a lucrative career uh, for, for who he was in that time frame, in that era. And he forsook the name that he had made for himself when Jesus Christ saved him and said, I will not play jazz music, but I will use my talents for the gospel of Christ. And in his service, hear me now, in his service, he came into a place of hurt. In his compliance to what God wanted for his life, he came into a place of a lack of understanding. He came into a place of a broken spirit. And he had to say and testify that I came to the place that I needed God to heal my broken spirit. I mean, I'm just asking you, have you ever been there? I mean, this, this gospel that we preach, it applies to real life. I mean, it's not just for the roses and it's not just for the smiles and everything's great. But, but it's okay to understand that sometimes life just falls apart. Amen. But in the midst of it, what I want to know and what God wants to know is when your life is not going the way that you want it to, where will your worship fall? Oh, come on now. Some of us know how to worship problems. (laughs) Amen. Some of us know how to worship chaos. You're wondering what in the world I'm talking. Some of us know how to worship work. Some of us know how to worship our complaints. Because it's all we talk about. That's all that ever comes out of our mouth. Amen. And so I want to ask you tonight that are feeling like you're low, that are feeling like you're hurting. I'm going to encourage you, but I want to ask you, when's the last time you talked about the goodness of God? Amen. I know we can complain about gas prices. I don't like gas prices, do you? I don't like, I think the grass stays greener longer in other states than it does in Texas. It turns brown here. Actually, the brown grass is comforting to me. I'm used to it. But, uh, but, man, it's uglier here. It don't get as cold here. We don't get as much snow. It's too hot in the summer. Do you see what I'm doing? I mean, everything I'm saying is true. But what good is it? I mean, I'm just, I'm just complaining. I mean, what about it? Does everybody know about your problems or does everybody know about your God? Now, does everybody know, know about how bad it is or does everybody know about how good God is? I mean, that's the questions that I want to ask you tonight because what you've got to come to understand and what you need to realize right here tonight is just because you may be in the place of hardness right now, my friend, it doesn't mean that God's upset with you or that you've done anything wrong or that you're any further away from God than you were last week. It simply means that you're a human, you're living life right now. You might be on the edge of a crisis and you need help, but the good news is is that you're in the right place, amen, and you've come to the place where God understands that we are broken and imperfect humans and we need help from an almighty God, amen, and I believe firmly that here tonight, if you will realize that God is not upset with you, God has not forgotten you, 
God is not against you, even though you may be going through hardness right now. But even on the rather, I will show you in the following verses, amen, that God said when you reach into your hard place of life, you need to know it's because I've chosen you. And if I've chosen you, I must chasten you because you're my son, amen. Amen. Now, come on. I thought that serving God was supposed to be all joy and that when we served God, all of our sorrows were left behind and all these great things. Well, they make good songs. Right. But that's not what the Bible says. I mean, you've read the book of Job. You've heard the words of Christ. You read how that Peter was was in prison. You've read how that Paul and Silas were imprisoned. What about Paul? Do you, anybody read the book of Corinthians and read Paul listing out his sufferings for the gospel's sake? I mean, and what are we upset with? Because, because we didn't get a promotion that we wanted? Because we weren't hashtag blessed with some more debt in a new vehicle? I mean, come on, I, I'm, I'm, I know that I'm being a little facetious, but I'm asking you to not really, in the grand scheme of things, as much as you might be able to complain about in your life right now, it pales in comparison to what God did for you when you were just a wretched sinner. It's easy to stand up and testify when things are going great and say, if God never did another thing for me, I could never quit thanking him for what he already did. But when we get in the place where we don't see God working, we begin to make statements like Mr. Dorsey and saying, God, I I don't see how this is fair. Amen. But I want you to know that God has already done more for you than you deserve. Amen. But he's not forsook you. Amen. And you might feel like he's left you all alone. But I'm here to tell you your story's not over yet. Hallelujah. You're still breathing. And God's not done. Amen. Paul likens this race, this Christian race. Amen. This Christian walk. To a race rather, trying to get my words together. Amen. And in our reading, we see these two words used that in our vernacular they really don't go together. He says, I want you to run and I want you to be patient. Well, I, or Tons, Tons, come up here, buddy. All right, do you know what it means to be patient? Like when you won on the Xbox, I'll tell you, you got to do something first. That means you're going to be patient, right? What's it mean to run? What's it mean to run? Be fast, right? Show me, Mr. Speedster. Run, run to that back door. Run to the back door. Show me how fast you can do it. All right, he's faster than that. He's embarrassed right now. All right, now... Patiently walk back to the front. Well, those are two different things, aren't right? Thank you, buddy. You can go sit down with mama. You can go sit down with mama, buddy. Those are two different things. I mean, when we think about running, we think about being fast, effort. Have any of you ever ran in a race? I mean, it's, it's, it's exhilarating. You get your, foot, your feet going and the guy's in the lane next to you and you're trying to win. I mean, that's a race. And where's the patience in it? See, when we think of patience, we think of somebody that's slow uh, to get upset, somebody that's easygoing, somebody that's perhaps not in a hurry. Uh, but really, that's, that's not the definition in this word of patience. The Greek word here simply means steadfastness, constancy, endurance. In other words, we are encouraged to run this life in such a way that we are not swayed from our cause by any noise or circumstance. Steadfast. Amen. Have you ever made your mind up you was going to do something? Man, you ought to see some of my kids. If they want candy, if, if, if little man over there, Henry, he's fixing to turn four years old. If that boy wants something in our house, we have got to make sure that he doesn't even know that the spot it's in exists. Because if he has to stack chair upon chair and a stool on top of that, he's going to get whatever he wants. He's very persistent. This is the image with 
that, that, that Paul is trying to encourage us to run with. A steadfastness that cannot be swayed. Now, the reason that we must have our mind made up that we're not going to be turned away from our running is that we must note that injuries happen. It's the first rule of running. Injuries are going to happen. If you run long enough, something is going to hurt. I bet you if most of us ran one lap around the church tonight, something on us would hurt. You know? Now, this Christian life, this experience... It's the same. It's a test of endurance. There's moments where we feel like we've got it on cruise control, and there's moments when we're grinding it out and every step hurts. Amen. If you're going to run, they say that the most common injuries are ankle sprains, muscle cramps, ligament tears, specifically knee damage. Amen. That sounds great, doesn't it? Everybody go run and be healthy. Amen. On an elliptical. And here Paul likens our Christian life to a race that we require something far greater than a simply a fast start. Amen. You ever seen two guys race where one got off to a good start, but he didn't know how to finish? Man, I I remember when we were uh, lining up and testing for some 40-yard dashes once. There's this kid that played a a position, and it was supposed to be a speed position. And, uh, and, and mine, I played a, a, you know, a linebacker in an end position. My position was very explosive. And so when we got on that 40-yard dash, man, them first 10 or 15 yards, I left that kid so far in the dust it wasn't even funny. I thought I had this thing. And he played safety. And safeties are just flighty, fast guys. And I thought I had left him. And here in just a second, here, <laughs> he went right past me, you know. I had a good start. But I didn't have enough to win that race. Amen. And if you're going to make it living for God, you've got to have a whole lot more than just a good start. Amen. Well, everybody can have a good testimony when you get saved. (laughs) Yeah. Come on. We can come in here and get cleaned up from drugs and alcohol and all the sinful music and all these things and say, God set me free. And it's a powerful testimony and everybody's excited about it. Amen. And, and we rejoice with those that have the testimony. Amen. But we are all also saying just keep on running because we want that same testimony 20 years from now. Amen. We've seen a lot of people start off great. Amen. But I want to see somebody that's going to keep on running. Amen. When they get hurt. Amen. Keep on running when somebody talks about them. Keep on running when somebody lies about them. Keep on running when they're misunderstood. Keep on running when their family gets sick. Come on now. I want somebody that's going to run. Hey, man, I'm looking for somebody that's going to run for God. Hey, man. Because the problem is even a world-class sprinter would have trouble Winning the New York Marathon because they're different kinds of races. They're different types of mentalities. One's flashy, amen, and everybody likes to watch it. Not a whole lot of people like to watch a two and a half hour marathon or an hour and a half run. No, not a whole lot of people get into the endurance sport of, of where this is going to keep my attention because we've been trained to, to follow after things that flash and change quickly. Amen. But, 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 but in the midst of our life, as distractions fly all around us, as trials come in and beset us, as businesses fail, hello, as bills stack up, as children get sick, as people die, when your tires go flat, when your cars break down, when your plans fall apart, when your dreams get crushed, who are you going to turn to? Amen. Because all of these things happen to good people. If you haven't seen this happen to somebody in the church yet, stay a little longer and you will see these things happen to good people. And my question tonight for you good people is, amen, how are you going to respond to your hurt? Amen, I know you didn't want it. I know you didn't expect it. Amen, but you've got to notice that the devil uses people to hurt people. I'm going to say that again. The devil uses people To hurt people. Now let me make a second statement. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever been given. Had a preacher tell me never put a face on the devil. And so I'm going to tell you that the devil uses people to hurt people. And in the same breath I'm going to tell you don't put a face on the devil. 
Hello. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Hello. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Your brother and your sister, no matter how much you think they might be your problem, there's a spirit that's your problem, and I don't know if it's yours or it's theirs, but I'm telling you we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Amen. But if you've come under the banner of the cross, amen, and you've stepped foot through the blood of Calvary, amen, we're under one spirit. Amen. We're in one unity. And it's not the spirit of unity, brother. It's the unity of the spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And in our lives, even when we're hurting and it's messy, amen, there is a path to stick to and a race to run. Amen. People will talk about you. People will lie about you. People will lie to you. People will cheat you. People will almost always put their interest above yours. And it hurts the most when you care. Because even people you love will treat you this way. And what are you going to do when it hurts? Huh? If you haven't had your heart ripped out yet, my friend, you will. And I'm asking you now, before you're in the trial of your life, what are you going to do when it hurts? Amen. Children make bad decisions. Friends will let you down and leave you. And it happens to the best of people. But I want you to notice that bad circumstances are not always from the devil. <laughs> They're not always because you made a poor decision. They're not always because of anything. Well, that's mysterious, isn't it? That could, you, could you deal with the fact that your trial could not be about you? Could you live that? Jesus did. I mean, he, he bore the burden and the shame of the cross and the grief and the contradiction of sinners against himself. That's what the Bible was saying. He absolutely despised what he was going through, yet he knew he had a course to finish. Amen. God uses our trials to help us, not to harm us, even though at the time, sometimes they hurt us. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, so if you belong, if you're a child of God, you can expect chastening to refine your character. That's, that's what the Bible just said. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Who, has anybody ever thanked their dad for their spankings? I did. I have. Once in a while, I just tell him. You know? I just tell One time when I was 12 years old, I wanted an earring. I know that sounds retarded. It is. And I wanted one. Dad tried to explain it to me. You know? I grew up and became a man. Said, Thank you, Dad. Thanks, Dad. You know, I remember the last real spanking he gave me. I was seven years old, and I cried because I wanted to wear a left-handed ball glove and, and uh, you know, for, for a lefty over here. And I had the other because I was the only kid on my ball team that had a black glove, and my brother's glove was brown, but you had to wear it on opposite hands. And I couldn't get that through my seven-year-old head and start crying about it. My dad knelt down there in Markle, Texas, put his hand rolling back my head and said, son, I'm raising you to be a man, and you're not going to be able to cry about stupid things like this. And he bent me over his knee, and he busted me with his belt, and he held my hand, and he walked me to my ball game. And that was the last spanking I got from my dad. <laughs> now, I'll just tell you, I still thank him for the way that he raised me. I still thank him for the times that he was hard on me. And let me show you something here that the Bible, because I have a feeling that you feel the same way about your fathers. You love and respect your fathers. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasten us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. And so literally, 
child of God, you might be in the hardest trial of your life and the very reason that you're there right now is because God knew you were ready to go through the process that you might be partakers of his nature. Amen. That you might be partakers of his holiness. That somehow in this world that oozes and goozes with sin, there would be another agent walking this world that had the love of God oozing out of them. How can I be that person when you become a partaker of his nature and you learn that even suffering and hardness amen there is still honey in the rock there's still a sweetness of the spirit there's still manna on the ground you may not like what it looks like beyond but God is still providing for you my friend and he's brought you to this very place amen and while the world looks on at your hurt amen I want to ask you what are you gonna do when you're hurt Amen. I want to tell somebody, just keep on running. Amen. Just keep on running. Amen. Looking unto Jesus. The author. Amen. He was the prime example in his suffering on the cross. The Bible says that he's also the finisher of our faith. The perfect example in his work of salvation. He despised the shame of sin on the cross. He endured our punishment. The man that had never known sin tasted of the punishment of sin. It was opposite of him. To do so went against his very nature. Well, what if God puts on your heart to be extra nice to somebody that rubs you the wrong way? You got anybody that just knows how to get under your skin? Have you shown them the love of God? Hmm? I, 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 I want to, I wanna, man, I want to challenge, I want to challenge us tonight. Amen. I, I fear that in this last day, that if we're not careful, we will become nothing but stories and tales of yesteryear. Hey Amen. I, I, I heard of a place called the Chain Rock, Kentucky. Some of you may have been there. There's a little town uh, in Kentucky that they told the story that this boulder had fallen off of the mountain and that it would possibly come down and crash the, roll the whole town away in this holler sometime. And so to make the kids feel better about it, everybody started saying, well, we chained it to the mountain up there. Well, it got to be such a popular Old uh, wives tell that people started driving from all over Kentucky to come and see this big old boulder that had to be chained to the mountain. And there wasn't a chain that was holding the boulder to the mountain. And so they finally decided that after years of this happening that they would go and install this massive chain, drill it into the rock, drill, and made this great big piece of, uh, of scenery, I guess, that you can drive out to this town and see the Chain Rock, Kentucky. And the townspeople said this. They said, we were just tired of people to come and see something that didn't exist. Now, we tell stories of healing. Huh? But we've also seen them right here in the sanctuary. Huh? We've heard stories of whole families getting saved, and, and, and it doesn't seem like it happens just a whole lot. Amen. But I'm here tonight as one of them. Amen. We've had the family that came in last year and that, that whole the most awesome baptism service that I've ever seen. Amen. The whole family. It doesn't happen all the time, but I'm telling you that God's still working. Amen. And right here in the midst of your bitterness, you, I want to, I want to caution the church. You are not the only ones with issues. You're not the only one that's fighting against oppression. You're not the only one that's fighting against chaos. You're not the only one with family problems. The entire world is feeling the same pressure that you're feeling right now. Amen. We're all feeling the hurt. Amen. And I'm trying to encourage the church. Amen. There's still a race to run, even when you're hurting. Amen. There must be an inward determination. Every marathon winner will tell you that they have a quitter that lives inside of their head. I mean, one of the most famous of all time, Steve Prefontaine said, what makes the difference between a champion and a novice is the man that can turn the voice inside of his head off. 
Amen. Sometimes it's easier just to, to do what you know that you should be doing, amen, instead of doing what you think you ought to be doing, amen, or doing what you feel like you ought to be doing, amen, but to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, (laughs) to him it is sin, amen, and right here in this last day and hour, church, don't let us, don't let us be an empty-handed, a church without work or or even a person, let's talk on on a personal level, where you live at, the people that you come in contact with, are your hurts and your trials too great for you to be the example and the light that you need to be? Hello. I, I, know, I know that this can come across a little bit harsh here, and I'm, 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 I don't want to be abrasive in any way, and I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm going to move us into this place of encouragement, but I want you to know that you can throw yourself a pity party. You know what I'm saying? If you want to, you can. And, and some of you got more than enough to be upset about. I, I, you know, I could tell you stories. I, I, could, I could blow your mind with some stories of stuff that my wife and I have been through for such a young age. I mean, I could, I could, I could tell you sob stories if I wanted to. But that ain't going to do you no good. You got your own. You got your heartaches. You got your sad stories. You got your letdowns. I mean, but you know, the one thing that we also have in common is that we've all experienced and tasted of the goodness of God. And we all can say that it was that way and I was in a low place and I was in a hard place and I was in despair. But when I call on Jesus, amen, I I know that there was the place of struggle and there was the place of depression and there was the place of chaos. but But I gotta say it's different now than it was then. Amen. And how did I get from there to where I am now? I just put my head down and I kept on running. Come on now. There ain't nothing special. Amen. About a child of God, amen, but it's the Spirit of God working in them, hallelujah, both to will and to do. Amen. Could somebody come and help us on the music here tonight? We're just about done. Amen. In the 2012 Olympics, amen, there's a man running for the U.S. team in the 4 by 400 meter relay named Manteo Mitchell. I mean, another. Manteo Mitchell. I don't know how long the average Olympic runner spends training for these events. Um, You know, I don't know how many years go into these things exactly, but we know that at Slim Pickens, not a whole lot of people make it there. The ones that do, they want to perform well. This man was running, and he said that the night before this race, he took a funny step off of some stairs where they had the athletes housed, and his leg was hurting him. And it had him nervous. So the race went off on this 4 by 400 meter in the qualifying round. At the 150 meter mark, so less than halfway through his lap, his leg snapped. Loud enough that the runners beside him heard his pop. Okay? 250 meters to go. First lap of the race. He said, it hurt. I heard it snap. He said, but all that I knew to do was to just keep running. Now, the amazing thing about that was Manteo Mitchell did. He finished 250 more meters around. He handed off the baton. Next man went on and ran four laps later. They look up at their time on the chart, Brother Marino, and there's a special signifier to it because they just ran the fastest mile relay that's ever been recorded in history. To this day, it's the standing record. That's amazing, isn't it? And the newspaper, I'll tell you where I read that story. I opened up the Paducah Sun. We were living in Kentucky. I flipped out that newspaper, and I, this headline caught my attention. And it said, fastest race ever ran by a man with broken leg. Amen. You know, I reading back over that story, praying about this service, And I did feel the Spirit of God inspire me to tell some of you, you might feel like you're running hurt, but you are running better than this world's ever seen. Amen. You may not feel like it right now. You may feel like your life's a mess and you you can't make sense of up or down and there's so many hurts. Amen. But what you don't know is that the joy in your heart and the smile on your face when you walk through this church doors and your hands are up and you're worshiping, 
You're just encouraging and strengthening the church all around you. Some of you are going through trials we know about. Some of you are going through trials that we don't know anything about. Amen. But I'm here to tell you that if you'll keep following after Jesus, amen, he's going to heal your broken heart. He's going to help your hurts. Amen. And he's going, he's going to make what you're going through now just a distant memory. Amen. I felt the Lord want me to share about the night I got saved. And I, I think only ever one, maybe one or two other times before anywhere ever shared. <clears throat> and I, I couldn't have known what the, the choir was going to sing tonight. Amen. But I'm about to try to help somebody find your way out of your hurt. Amen. And, and, and find your strength to go on. Amen. The night I got saved. Amen. How many of you were here? Who was here? Anybody who all was here for that? 14 years ago now. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for praying for me. Amen. I went home that night and I'd come into that church service. I, I mean, I was I was a wicked young man. I didn't have no desire for the things of God. I didn't didn't listen to preaching. None of these things. It wasn't a typical church experience. But the sincere prayers of my dad and brother Snow made me realize that these guys really believe what they're saying. And that's what got me under conviction. I prayed and God saved me. And brother Snow was gracious enough to let us be going to uh, Camp Pinal the next morning with everybody. And uh, what I didn't tell him is I was supposed to be back at uh, MEPS <laughs> to go through that process again. So I went to Camp Pinal instead of uh, Mips. But that night, I remember before I went to bed wondering, now I really, you know, now I really make the right choice here? Is this, you know, is that real? Do I really want to go to this youth camp, all this kind of stuff? I was wrestling with these things in my mind. And uh, I went to sleep wrestling with those, probably three, four in the morning, something like that. And I don't even remember what time we had to be here, seven the next morning. It, was, it was, wasn't much sleep left that I could get. I remember waking up. And, uh, and just feeling like something was terribly wrong. You know, that's the only way I know how to describe it. Feeling like something's terribly wrong. And, uh, and I remember just all of a sudden, I was not a spiritual person, not a religious person, but all of a sudden now, I've been saved and I, feel, I can feel evil in my room. I'm just telling you what, you can, you can call me crazy, you write off what you want, I'm telling you what happened to me, and this is what keeps me serving God when I have questions. When I tried to get up out of that bed because of the eerie feeling, I couldn't get my head off of my pillow. I couldn't lift it up. And all of a sudden, I felt hands reach around my neck and start to choke me. And I tried to scream to my dad for help. Nothing came out. I tried to scream for anybody to help. Nothing came out. I'm sitting there choking, lifeless. Say, so, I don't know. Was it a demon? I don't know. Have a mental episode? I don't know. I don't know. I'll tell you what I do know. I'll tell you what I do know. When nothing could help me. And I, Brother Brown, I couldn't utter a word. I couldn't bring words out of my mouth. At the top of my lungs, I had the freedom to yell Jesus. And I remember there in that moment feeling like life was leaving my body in the presence of evil in my room. This is not, y'all prayed me through. I'm telling you, I went home fighting. Is this stuff real? Do I really need to go to Camp Pinal? Is all this? And I'm telling you, right there in the middle of that night, I felt life being choked out of me but in the middle of a situation that I couldn't handle brother Jerry I found out there's power in the name of Jesus come on now and let me tell you something I found out in my life's greatest curse there's a name I can call on hallelujah when my daughter is sick when my wife is going lifeless come on when we're being carried blood into the hospital there's a name I can call on Giving us a name we can call on. It's the name that's above every name. Hallelujah. The name that makes all of hell tremble and demons flee. It's the name that gives us life. It's the name that brings us power. It's the name that sets us free. Hallelujah. It's your hope and it's your peace tonight. It's your freedom and it's in Jesus. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me right here tonight, church?
Hallelujah. Amen. I, like I, I know, I'm telling you, I, I had not shared that very much. It's different, I know. But the Lord knows what you're going through. And the Lord knows what you've been battling. Hello. Behind the closed walls and the closed doors. But nobody else is there. And it's you and the enemy and God. God knows what you're going through. And right here in these altars tonight, there's a place of solace and there's a place of help. Because He is here. Because He is here. And He is our help. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that you love us somehow despite our mistakes and our shortcomings. God, we admit in the frailty of our human minds that there are moments this life hurts so bad that we feel like you're not fair. There's moments we feel like the hurt's intentional and we don't know how much longer that we can handle. And I pray right here tonight that God that comforts those that are cast down would comfort tonight, God, with answered prayer. Would you meet us in this altar? And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Church, could you come in and find yourself a place to pray? Amen. Be sensitive to the Spirit. Find somebody to pray with. Amen. If you're an altar worker, hallelujah, work the altar.